This module, assisting LGBTI plus children and young people, put together by Mojcha Urek, Andrzej Jurczyk, and Andrzej Poglajen, lecturers, assistants, and researchers in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Ljubljana, covers the following topics. How to research and monitor violence against LGBTI plus children and young people with a view to delivering adequate intervention, a description of multiple tools and strategies for educating professionals and effecting change in an organization and its environment to introduce affirming practices and to establish safe places, the importance of evaluation and how to build an evaluation strategy. By the end of the module, you will have acquired the tools to explore violence and to design, implement and evaluate actions to combat violence against LGBTI plus children and young people. Existing research shows that LGBTI plus people face multiple challenges, discrimination and stigma in different areas of life. For LGBTI plus children and young people, school and family environments seem to be of even greater importance as these are the settings in which primary socialization takes place and are therefore crucial for a child's development. Furthermore, healthcare services and NGOs working with children and young people, either in a general capacity or LGBTI plus focused, are environments that need to be specifically addressed to improve services and provide safe spaces for LGBTI plus children and young people. To adequately address the systemic issues facing LGBTI plus children and young people, including discrimination and violence, and to devise programs and interventions to most effectively meet their needs, young people themselves must be in a position to voice their concerns and engage with those in power. LGBTI plus children and young people are not just providers of information on violence, but stakeholders who can actually shape the research and effect change. Violence related to homo, bi, trans and interphobia in general remain largely unaddressed by national, European and international institutions, partly on account of the lack of data on violence motivated by hatred against LGBTI plus people. The same, if not worse, applies to LGBTI plus children and young people. Documenting the occurrence of incidents of violence owing to homo, bi, trans and interphobia is therefore a crucial step in advocating for better legal protection from such crimes and violence. Data collection can be carried out by different actors. Public actors, the judiciary system, the police and human rights institutions, or LGBTI plus NGOs and human rights NGOs. In the case of hate crimes and violence, it is important to bear in mind that states are primarily responsible for data collection. However, in the absence of accurate recording by state bodies, it falls on civil society to collect data on human rights violations and to report this information to the public authorities. Most data collection and monitoring of violence against LGBTI plus children and young people are executed in schools and educational settings, whereas other areas and sectors are severely or wholly neglected. The scarcity of data on violence against LGBTI plus children and young people is problematic for various reasons. Firstly, it prevents us from gaining an accurate global, regional and national picture of this form of violence to understand it better. Secondly, it contributes to sexual orientation and gender identity expression being ignored in the design of national and local anti-violence policies. Furthermore, it exacerbates the invisibility of violence on account of homo, bi, trans and interphobia in the eyes of various sectors. Finally, in most countries, different sectors do not have the evidence necessary to design and roll out appropriate and effective responses to this form of violence. This constitutes a vicious circle that compounds the lack of visibility of LGBTI plus students and the violence they face. There are some good examples of monitoring violence based on sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, or SOGI for short, in education we can learn from. Ten European countries monitor or have monitored SOGI-based violence in education. These include Albania, Belgium, Finland, France, some regions of Germany, 
Ireland, Norway, the Netherlands, Sweden and the UK. Here are some examples. In Belgium, the Federal Centre for Equal Opportunities encourages students, bystanders and teachers to report SOGI-based violence in schools and monitors these reports. The anonymized data is published in a yearbook that feeds into policy recommendations. In Ireland, several departments commissioned research documenting LGBTI plus students' experience of violence and discrimination between 2005 and 2009. In 2013, this research informed the development of the National Action Plan on Bullying. When repeated in regular studies, data from these surveys can be used to measure trends and patterns over time. In the United Kingdom, the Department for Education monitors and documents bullying, including on grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity, through longitudinal surveys conducted in England and Wales. Education sectors may also lack the adequate funding to undertake such research. It is worth noting that some education sectors have availed of data generated by other government sectors, such as the health sector. For instance, in Ireland, the National Office for Suicide Prevention funded a recent study, 2016, that explores the links between negative treatment of LGBTI plus people and increased mental health risks. The study includes detailed data on secondary school and university students' experience of SOGI-based violence. Others have published reviews of existing research, sparing the efforts required to perform new research. For example, in Sweden, the Public Health Agency reviewed existing research and published two reports on the health and well-being of LGBTI plus people aged 16 to 84 for the period 2005 to 12. The reports included a section on nature and the prevalence of SOGI-based violence in schools. Others have funded universities or research institutes to undertake research into violence against LGBTI plus students. For example, in Albania in 2016, a national study on students' experiences of discrimination at school was commissioned. The study specifically referred to LGBTI plus students' experience of discrimination and violence. It must be understood that tools and strategies to combat violence against children should be implemented at different levels, such as the day-to-day -day practice of professionals, the organizational culture of specific environments, for example, schools, hospitals, and family services, and wider communities. One of the first steps an organization can take to determine where it stands in terms of inclusivity and openness to LGBTI plus people is to undertake a simple self-evaluation. If executed properly, this can also give an indication of what their services might already be doing well, while also pinpointing the most crucial elements to be addressed with a view to incorporating inclusive and affirming practices. Multiple tools and guidelines are provided online by LGBTI plus organizations to be used and implemented by other organizations providing general, non-LGBTI plus specific services. The tools require the staff and management to appraise different areas of the organization, such as the inclusiveness of organizational policies and procedures, the safety, inclusiveness and accessibility of the organizational environment, the inclusiveness of data collection practices in relation to diverse sex characteristics, gender identities and sexual orientations, the creation of opportunities for meaningful engagement and consultation with LGBTI plus communities, the knowledge, skills and confidence of professionals and other staff to work with LGBTI plus service users in a respectful manner, having a so-called LGBTI plus champion in place, that is, a person equipped with the experience or expertise pertinent to LGBTI plus service users and the resources to advance the organization's inclusiveness and accessibility. As we can see, such tools guide the user, either individual professional or organization as a whole, to evaluate different aspects of practice and the provision of services. Once the organization has committed to addressing the issues LGBTI plus children and young people face through education, we can take specific steps to produce the optimal effect. Here we shall focus on the STEPS proposal put forward by Compton and Whitehead in 2015. 
However, as we will deliberate further in the third part of this module, training programs can be adapted to better suit the needs of a specific training environment. The first step is to prepare the staff. Staff training could take the form of reading, panel or group discussions, a didactic format, or any combination of these. The second step is to educate the students on common conditions and issues affecting LGBTI plus individuals, provided either as standalone sessions, directed reading, or with the information integrated into existing course content as points of knowledge or interest. Students can be then organized into small groups for the purpose of discussing cases and social vignettes. The third step, which will be discussed further at the end of this training module, is to evaluate the students or training participants. The authors propose pre-post test designs to measure participants' knowledge, competence, attitudes, and so on. If need be, the training can be repeated or other topics can also be addressed. The authors address a significant stumbling block to training, which is lack of time. Their proposal to prepare faculty members is therefore limited in time, while students' education can be included throughout studies and incorporated into existing content. Supporting and addressing families with LGBTI plus children and young people. Up to this point, we have focused extensively on organizations, professionals working with LGBTI plus children and young people in the local or national context that needs to be considered. Nevertheless, since we're talking about LGBTI children and young people, another significant factor in the provision of supportive environments are their parents, families, guardians and or other significant others. Services and professionals that come into contact with families with LGBT plus children and young people should also be able to support them and to tackle challenges they might be facing if need be. As you have heard in previous modules, families are the setting for primary socialization and are thus important for a child's development. They can also be a place of violence and neglect, which is even more common if a child is in any way non-hetero and cis-normative. Family services and other professionals who come into contact with parents and primary guardians of children and young people should offer material with valuable information in case family members are struggling with a child's identity or with the process in which a child is trying to explore different identities. It's important for parents and children to realize that acceptance is a process that involves the entire family. Just as it takes time and support for LGBTI plus children to understand and accept their identity, this also applies to their families. The following are some basic guidelines that can be given to parents and families of LGBTI plus children and young people. Parents and families must play an important role in providing safe spaces where their child can explore interests without judgment or stereotypes and can support diverse friendships and social involvement without focusing on expectations around gender. Engage in conversations and check in regularly with their children about their interests, groups of friends, romantic attractions, and any bullying or teasing that may be taking place. Respond in an affirming, supportive manner when their child discloses their identity and understand that although gender identity cannot be changed, it is often revealed over time as children and young people discover more about themselves. Accept and love their child as they are and try to understand what they're feeling and experiencing. Stand up for their children when they're mistreated and not in any way minimize the social pressure or bullying the child may be facing. Be on the lookout for danger signs that may indicate a need for mental health support, such as anxiety, insecurity, depression, low self-esteem, and any emotional problems in their child and others who may not have a source of support otherwise. Help connect their child with LGBT plus organizations, resources, and events. It is imperative that they know that they are not alone. Celebrate diversity in all its forms. Provide access to a variety of books, films, and materials, including those that positively represent gender diverse individuals. Support their child's self-expression. Engage in conversations with them around their choice of clothing, jewelry, 
hairstyle, friends and room decorations. Reach out for education, resources and support if they feel like they need to further their own understanding of LGBTI plus youth experiences. Professionals working in the field of family services can and should always connect service users with local resources such as LGBTI plus organisations that offer extensive information and services. The need for inclusiveness at different levels can be observed in responses made by LGBTI plus people on what a competent service provider means to them. For them, the provider needs to be comfortable with their sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression and should be able to ask them about sexual orientation, gender identity and or relationship status. The provider should have LGBTI plus inclusive forms that list sexual orientation, gender identity and or relationship status and use gender neutral language when talking about reproductive health sexual health or relationship status. The office should have signs, posters and other visible signals that it is LGBTI plus inclusive and include sexual orientation and gender identity in the organization's posted non-discrimination statement. Gender neutral bathrooms in the office and or clinic setting should be provided and having LGBTI plus people on staff is also desirable. In practical situations, the professional should address everyone with the pronouns the person chooses for him, her or themselves and ask a person their chosen name and address them by it rather than their legal name. Providers should train staff on LGBTI plus competence, have knowledge of transgender specific healthcare needs and address them accordingly. Professionals should be comfortable with the patients who identify as transgender and have office policies and forms that are transgender inclusive. The responses, which are mostly sourced from a 2018 study carried out by the One Colorado Foundation Fund on LGBTI plus people's healthcare needs and experiences, cover challenges faced in other areas as well. Another interesting part of the responses, which are similar to those gathered in research within the Diversity and Childhood Project, is that they do not only address professionals' conduct, but also convey how environments or organizations themselves should visibly convey their LGBTI plus inclusivity. The main purpose of providing professional development activities regarding LGBTI plus children and young people is to help create safer and more affirming environments for this population. So the question is, how can LGBTI plus inclusive, safe and affirming professional practice be executed the best way to reach professionals is to present and include LGBTI plus training as part of their professional development. It should not be forgotten that the provision of adequate care and services based on an individual's needs is an ethical duty of professionals in any area of work. Furthermore, there is extensive supportive research and evidence. The challenges and needs of LGBTI plus children and young people can therefore in no way be minimalized, overlooked or neglected. Based on the length and type of training, such as online, in practical settings or in a classroom, the training differs in content, size, approach and teaching method employed. More often than not, training uses didactic methods with a focus on the basics, such as LGBTI plus terminology, history, stigma and challenges faced by LGBTI plus people. Nevertheless, as the aforementioned example shows, training can be focused on specific issues, such as tackling LGBTI plus bullying and other anti-LGBTI plus behavior. Furthermore, research has demonstrated that simple didactic teaching can be used to enhance professionals' knowledge and mindsets. That said, in order to achieve a more lasting and greater impact on participants, using different methods is usually the best approach. For example, personal stories of LGBTI plus people can be used, either as a real-life example in the form of a recorded video, scripted film or documentary, or even presented in person through a personal narration or theatre experience. It has been proven in the past that this bears a greater impact on participants' mindsets and empathy and heightens the importance of the training in the eyes of the participants.
Now let's take a look at LGBTI plus training content. Professionals taking part in training have different levels of knowledge and experience of working with LGBTI plus people and addressing their needs in a competent manner. For this reason, their training should include both basic contents and specific topics relevant to the area of work. Most often than not, training includes definitions, language, facts and assumptions related to LGBTI plus people, including the effects of heteronormativity and cisnormativity, history of LGBTI plus movements, including discrimination and stigma in the past and today, issues faced by LGBTI plus people in everyday life and especially barriers to accessing social, health and other services, interpersonal and systemic bias, policies relevant to LGBTI plus people and strategies for enhancing professionals' knowledge and improving access to services. Some programs that focus more on the field of healthcare services can also concentrate on HIV AIDS, mental health, especially depression, anxiety, substance abuse and suicide, which are statistically more prevalent in LGBTI plus communities, barriers to accessing healthcare services, sometimes with a specific focus on trans health, and providing culturally competent healthcare. Issues faced by transgender people are sometimes addressed in a separate part of the training, since it is a lesser known and thus more challenging topic to comprehend for professionals. What's more, content focusing on bisexuality and intersexuality is much less common. The aforementioned training might also include topics such as intersecting of identities and intersectionality, relationships and families of LGBTI plus people, domestic and sexual violence. The content of the training depends on the time allotted to the training, its goals, specific environments and target audience. By now, we have mentioned multiple times that besides providing training to staff, the environment itself needs to change in order to be welcoming to LBGTI plus children and young people. Most of the places we visit, might it be schools, libraries, stores, family associations, hospitals and so on, are all laden with content that is heteronormative and cisnormative. The media, as well as advertising in newspapers, on television and in the streets, mostly show straight relationships, nuclear families with a father, a mother and children. These images are presented as a norm, the only normal way to live and love. Therefore, in addition to offering training to employees, organizations should also think about what kind of image they convey to the world. How do they present their services? Who do they target with their marketing tools? brochures, posters, advertisements, etc. Are the people and cases presented in these materials diverse? Do they show diverse family structures and people of different gender expressions, identities, ethnicities and abilities? Do they reflect children they're working with? Do children and young people have positive role models in their environment, in their literature for example? Does the organisation convey inclusiveness and a safe space for LGBTI plus children and young people? Does the organization have gender-neutral bathrooms? Answering these kind of questions might help the organization understand whether their current practices are either a. hostile and convey explicit negative messages, b. non-inclusive with implicit negative messages, c. inclusive with implicit positive messages, or d. affirming conveying explicit positive messages. In other words, does the organization convey messages that reinforce harmful gender stereotypes or are their practices gender transformative in a manner that extends beyond the heteronormativity, cisnormativity and gender binarism? These are just a few questions an organization can answer to determine whether their environment is LGBTI plus affirming. Although the training for professionals often includes information on making the environment more LGBTI plus inclusive, the question, how can we create LGBTI plus and gender non-conforming, inclusive, safe and affirming environments, should be addressed by the organization's employees or management as to whether training on cultural competence is executed or not. The following is a list of changes and actions organizations can undertake in their environment 
with a view to conveying a message of inclusiveness and LGBTI plus friendly spaces. One, organizations should develop non-discrimination policies that include gender identity, sexual orientation, gender expression, and sex characteristics. Two, the organization can actively address the need for training and professional development by providing an ongoing training program on cultural competence for working with LGBTI plus children and young people. Three, organizations should address hetero and cis normativity in written documents and activities, including making changes to intake forms and other paperwork, so that they include options outside the gender binary for both children and families. Four, lastly, organizations should make connections with other organizations study programs and eventually local and national LGBTI plus organizations in order to include the issues concerning LGBTI plus children and young people in curriculums and school policies and promote the education of professionals in other practical settings. If these steps are taken alongside the execution of training for employees, then different levels can be addressed simultaneously. It is hoped this will lead to cultural changes in the organization and truly result in more LGBTI plus friendly spaces and services. The context in which an individual organization might find itself with regard to the LGBTI plus competence of its staff and inclusive and affirming practices can be very diverse. This means that organizations might already have a number of practices in place that are LGBTI plus friendly, while others are just beginning to place an emphasis on this matter. Small changes in employees' professional conduct and changes in institutional policies can bear a major effect on LGBTI plus individuals. For example, research has shown strong correlations between environmental factors that either contribute to or diminish minority stress on LGBTI plus individuals in specific settings. What follows are basic principles for professionals working with LGBTI plus children and young people directed at both individual practice and at advocating for better institutional policies. The principles were developed for the DAC Project Handbook for Professionals. Respect self-identification and body diversity. A person's sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity and or sex characteristics should not be assumed on the basis of appearance. Recognize and understand that sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity and sex characteristics are distinct and not necessarily connected, and be able to differentiate them when working with LGBTI plus people and people in general. Understand that gender is a non-binary construct that allows for a range of gender identities and that a person's gender identity may not align with their sex assigned at birth. In addition, a person's gender identity may or may not be included within the gender binary. Professionals should use the names or pronouns someone uses or suggests with their self-identification and should not insist on the use of people's names written in their official papers. Professionals should not consider the exploration of sexual orientation or fluidity of gender expression and gender identity to be symptoms of disorders or an indication of psychopathology. Under no circumstances should professionals recommend that trans and or intersex children and adolescents undergo non-consensual medical procedures that can be postponed until the intersex person can decide for themselves and give fully informed consent. The exception to the rule only applies to interventions necessary to save the life of the intersex newborn, child or adolescent. Recognize that stigma, prejudice, discrimination and violence affect the health and well-being of LGBTI plus and gender non-conforming people, as well as the effects of institutional systemic barriers, such as discriminatory legislation on the lives of LGBTI plus people. Create a supportive and affirming environment for LGBTI plus and gender non-conforming people. Acknowledge and respect the importance of LGBTI plus relationships regarding them as equal to heterosexual ones, regardless of their legal recognition. Recognize the challenges related to multiple and often conflicting norms, values and beliefs faced by LGBTI plus young people 
who may also be members of racial and ethnic minority groups as well as other communities. Acknowledge that while LGBTI plus individuals might share common experiences, they are unique individuals with different needs and lives. It is crucial to recognize these differences and the different ways individuals experience discrimination and stigma. Acknowledge and be mindful of the existence of internalized stereotypes and be committed to creating an atmosphere of safety and trust as the cornerstone of applying best practices and providing affirming services. In order to gain a clearer picture of possible activities, strategies and resources to be employed when addressing issues concerning LGBTI plus children and young people, we present a number of good practices compiled at the outset of our Diversity in Childhood project. Education. In the field of education, tools such as LU, an educational toolkit for children from the age of four and seven, created by the province of Flemish Brabant in Belgium, are a useful resource. Lou is based on the innovative vision of diversity that forms the basis of the book Lou on the Way to School and other materials that are being developed. The material addresses gender and sexual diversity, but also diversity in age, skin color, religion, and so on. The toolkit consists of a broad range of materials and activities and manages to reach 70% of the development goals of Flemish kindergarten education. One small-scale example could be setting up LGBTI clubs as part of extracurricular activities. For example, schools in Slovenia offer optional contents or courses that students have to choose from. These contents include choirs, extra foreign language courses, theatre and so on. In one school, an LGBT club was set up by two teachers and provides a safe and supporting space for students. Another example in this field rolled out at national level is an action plan for the prevention of school violence executed by the government of Croatia. The action plan states that programs and prevention initiatives must include the prevention of gender-based violence, homophobic and transphobic violence, and must be implemented in schools. Although the data on implementation is not accessible, it should be pointed out that having such an action plan at national level can offer educators legislative commitment as well as support the inclusion of LGBTI plus issues in prevention programs. These are just a few examples ranging from local environments to national and even international practices. Many LGBTI plus and other human rights organizations offer training for schools with a view to providing safe schools for all children. Reaching out to the community and ascertaining what sort of resources are available in your local context should not be forgotten. Health. The following are some examples of good practices in the area of health garnered from the Diversity in Childhood project. Since 2013, the University Hospital in Ghent has a gender team, a multidisciplinary team specializing in the care of transgender people, including teenagers and children from the age of nine. The team also has a transgender info point, which is a place for everyone with questions about the transgender topic, including family, job and school related matters, trans care, discrimination and much more. Similarly, the Ministry of Health of the Regional Government of Andalusia in Spain initiated health assistance for transgender children and teenagers. It adheres to non-pathologizing perspectives that understand transgender matters as part of human diversity. In addition, the health services in Catalonia offer special services for trans people that adopt a biopsychosocial perspective, which includes specific medical, surgical, psychological and social assistance. What's more, in the case of minors, services are also provided for their families, and they also provide training to other doctors and carry out awareness raising campaigns. Another good practice from Hungary is a youth organization with integrated LGBTQI inclusive services. The Keck Vonal Child Crisis Foundation offers a helpline for all children and is LGBTQI inclusive and supportive, as many of their clients are LGBTI plus children. The organization offers mental health support, support for parents and prevention programs in schools. Portugal, on the other hand, has rolled out a number of strategies and guidelines at national level 
such as the National Health Strategy for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans and Intersex People, issued by the Health Ministry and offering guidance for professionals working with LGBTI people. Good Practices in the Area of Public Spaces The first good practice in the area of public spaces is an example of a regional practice. A Greek NGO, Colour Youth, launched the Tell Us initiative in 2013. It documents homophobic and transphobic violence, raises awareness about instances of violence and provides legal and psychological support to victims of violence. Another local example was found in Poland, where the mayor of the city of Warsaw signed an LGBT plus charter in 2019, the result of the active participation of many LGBT plus organizations, experts and city officials. The charter states that Warsaw is a city that strives for diversity and seeks to eradicate discrimination and hate speech against LGBT plus people. The charter also provides guidelines for future action in areas such as safety, education, culture and sports, work and administration. At national level, many countries have anti-discrimination acts in place, such as the Protection Against Discrimination Act adopted in Slovenia in 2016 which defines and prohibits discrimination and established the Office of the Advocate for the Principle of Equality. The Office has the option to perform an inspection of specific cases in which there is reason to believe individuals faced discrimination. In other countries or regions, such as the case of Catalonia in Spain, the regional government passed a law that specifically guarantees the rights of LGBTI people and strives to eradicate homo, bi and transphobia. The law addresses topics such as school, educational and training materials that must consider diversity, the prevention of school bullying, prevention and supportive measures for young people in vulnerable situations, training for parents, sports and leisure activities, and so on. Good practices in the realm of the family. The aims of the good practices presented here are to make families with LGBTI plus parents visible and to support parents of LGBTI plus children and young people. The first example is a picture called My Rainbow Family, produced and distributed by the Rainbow Families Association in Croatia. The book seeks to strengthen the social integration of children with same-sex parents and to promote tolerance and respect for diversity. An example of how to provide information and support for parents can be found in adapting publications issued by LGBTI plus and other human rights associations to your local language and adding useful local resources. Our partners in the Diversity and Childhood Project from Hungary in the past adapted and translated a publication made by IGLIO, OII Europe and EPA with the aim of providing parents of intersex children with useful information and guidelines. Unfortunately, the family environment can, on occasion, be a place of violence for LGBTI plus children that can sometimes lead to homelessness. For a short time in 2015 and 2016, our partners on the project from Poland offered an emergency LGBT plus hostel which offered accommodation, psychological and legal assistance and expert support in settling social and legal issues and in planning one's finances and future. Although the project was shut down due to lack of funding, it is an interesting example of integral services that could be offered to LGBTI plus children and young people that are victims of violence in their home environment. Other project members reported on other examples of publications that offer guidelines, information and resources for families, professionals and LGBTI plus children and young people in cases of violence or dealing with the gender diversity of their children. Good practices in the media landscape chiefly cover the efforts to educate journalists on how to report on LGBTI plus people. News stories are often sensational and use the wrong terminology when referring to LGBTI plus individuals. A number of European countries, including two of our partners on the Diversity in Childhood project, initiated an ethos project in 2018 with the aim of raising awareness among journalists and media students about homo, trans and biphobia in the media and the reproduction of harmful stereotypes of LGBTI plus groups. 
Slovenian NGO Transaxia issued a manual for reporting on transgender topics in the media. The manual was put together as a response to the existing media discourse and the lack of respectful reporting on transgender topics. The manual includes examples of bad practices and respectful alternatives, a glossary, key transgender topics and frequently asked questions. Other project partners reported on examples that can be found in national or regional television shows and were perceived as positive representations of LGBTI plus children and young people. These kinds of representations potentially have the power to bring LGBTI plus issues into the mainstream, to inform the general public and to break taboos. How can we begin building our evaluation strategy today at an individual or organizational level? One of the best starting points is working on one's self-reflection. The basic goal of self-reflection is to turn inward, to contemplate situations and be present to the thoughts that arise. Walking, running, sitting down or writing is an excellent way to practice self-reflection and there is no rule as to which form of self-reflection will work best for you. Engaging in all of this reflection enables us to create meaning from our experiences. Meaning becomes learning, which can then inform future mindsets and actions. In terms of evaluation, this meaning-making is crucial to our ongoing growth and development. Another important step would be to work on broadening your repertoire of evaluation strategies. It is important to keep in mind that the whole evaluation process is less about coming up with a perfect strategy than about finding one that best suits the content or the situation you are faced with. The outcome is usually also the best when choosing a strategy, one you are most comfortable with. So draw on your repertoire of strategies and figure out whether a checklist, a pre and post test, a concept map, an experiment, an interview, etc. is the strategy that best aligns with the content, the subject's preference and is the one you are most comfortable with. The same could be said for evaluation at the organisational level. It would be good to begin addressing inclusiveness practices, such as inclusive language on questionnaires, forms and in communication in general. The other element to assess would be visibility. Do hallway, classroom and or office images show diverse family structures, as well as people of different gender expressions or identities, sex characteristics, ethnicities and abilities? And is the overall institutional climate positive and inclusive, or is it overrun with hetero normativity? The easiest way to do all the above would be to resort to checklists and guides compiled by various LGBTI plus societies that help people and institutions make the first step towards a more inclusive society. As we have seen through this presentation, actions addressing issues facing LGBTI plus children and young people can be very diverse and implemented at different levels. The local and national contexts are key. Actions cannot be rolled out without taking the environment in which they are undertaken into account. Even then we cannot be sure that actions taken by professionals or organisations will result in the expected outcome and address the needs of LGBTI plus children and young people. The actions executed therefore need to be constantly appraised, improved and updated to bring about the optimal effect and afford LGBTI plus individuals the necessary support. We have now reached the end of our module. Now it is up to you to transfer and apply the knowledge gained over the whole course to your practice. We hope you have now learned how to research and monitor violence against LGBTI plus children and young people, have gleaned knowledge on how to implement intervention actions to combat the aforementioned violence, and have ideas on how to strive towards constantly improving your practice, be it as a parent, a teacher, a healthcare professional, a person working in the media or with the general public. We encourage you to engage in self-reflective behaviour and also to check out the additional resources provided to get you started. Thank you for listening. <laughs>